Um, welcome to the UABS and Forestry session. Um, we'll uh, introduce you to David Cahes, uh, Scott Spooner, and we'll also be joined by David Herry shortly. Uh, I'll pass it over to David Cahes from uh, Scion and your Tools for Forestry. All yours, David. Awesome. Good afternoon, guys. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Is that visible to everybody? All right. Good day, everyone. Um, once again, I am David Cajes. Uh, I work here at Scion, and I also represent Tools for Foresters. Uh, today, I shall be presenting to you what Tools for Foresters or TFF is, what we're aiming to do here, and um, ultimately how you can be a part of it. Um, this is our vision, eyes in the air, reducing the boots in the Blackberry. Uh, we play a leadership role helping industry and science come together to progress forestry through um, easier implementation of technology. So uh, we're just basically trying to remove technological hurdles and roadblocks to getting useful tech in the hands of foresters. And at the same time, attract new workers in the forest industry, um, upskilling them and just bringing everyone in the same level. Um, moving on, this is the uh, Forest Owners Association's vision for 2050. Uh, they are planning to uh, to have forestry be New Zealand's number one primary sector and exemplify the best plantation forest management in the world. So in order to do this, uh, they have listed technological change as one of the key influences in New Zealand forestry. Uh, they also aim uh, for forestry to have a reputation of being a, a leader in tech by applying data science and artificial intelligence to increase productivity and precision as well as bringing in automation and robotics as a way of future-proofing employment. Uh, ultimately, they aim to attract the best people in, into the industry to build a fruitful career, uh, one way of withstanding the ever-changing employment patterns that we see in our society today. So all of these very much play uh, well into our TFF vision. So some of the problems that we hear from industry with regards to UAV operations is the issue of upskilling. Uh, we have a very limited forestry specific training for UAVs. There is one that I know and that I have personally been on to, uh, which is being ran by um, Interpine uh, with Dave Harris. But uh, uh, And we have also got no follow-up support with no unit standards. So, um, and most of the time, it's not the forces role to resolve the technical issues or the roadblocks that, roadblocks that they encounter on the, on the job. Um, but aside from the technical issues, though, uh, to achieve our vision of UAV integration in the industry, we need the buy-in. Um, we need the people to see the benefit of having UAVs and what they can bring to the table. Uh, in order to deliver the most impact for industry, our research must also be aligned. Uh, there has been a disconnect between the research and the people who would benefit from it. And the science, and, and we do also understand that the scientific paper is not the best medium for the end user. Uh, it, it, it might need a little bit of, a, of translation there. Um, we also, seeing that young foresters who need this research are out of the loop um, and not all foresters see the value of this technology. Uh, we also see their research is not always visible to those who need it or worse, they don't know that it exists. Uh, there is also no feedback channel for foresters using the technology to communicate issues and needs with each other or with the scientists who are currently working on the technology. Uh, but by working closely with industry, we can achieve impact, we can achieve uh, uh, a good feedback loop between, um, sorry, between uh, industry needs and research. Uh, the foresters would feel ownership in the research. 
Uh, we can also accelerate research through small projects and our working group foresters would have a sense of importance in, in the research that we're doing and also for the next generations of foresters coming. Um, and lastly, we, we could increase technical knowledge and skills within the young. So TFF aims basically to uh, create a network and have a space to disperse knowledge advocating for the users of the technology. Uh, trials will also allow us to test and prove the technology. And to gain trust and build the skills, we also need to familiarize the technology. And uh, to do this, we create a series of simple tools that can be easily adopted by industry um, and are also our other partners. Uh, we also gain a reputation through delivering these tools and the research to back them up. Um, we also gain maximum impact by working closely with industry. Uh, to do this though, we need to create a network within the industry so that we have a good loop of beta testing and industry-based feedback. So uh, at Tools for Foresters, this is our structure. Um, the key points here is that our committee uh, drive drive things like SOP development, like standard operating procedures development, um, the upkeep of the website, which we're going to see later, and just an oversee, just to, to be the overseer of our uh, public forum platform. And then report back to our cluster group to ensure that we are on the right track. Uh, we are also looking to set up a beta testing team so that we can accelerate the development of the SOPs and, uh, and to also trial them as they're being churned out. So earlier this year, we sent out a survey to the forestry remote sensing cluster group. Um, 30 people from 19 companies responded. We found that companies had up to 14 UAVs in their operation and up to 27 pilots. Uh, interesting to note that 97% uh, of those are using DJI aircrafts. Uh, a UAV crafts. Um, we also asked people the reason why they're interested in tools for foresters. And the most common response was UAVs. So we are definitely on the right track with this one. Um, we also asked them uh, what is the biggest use for their UAVs. And the most common answer is to it being used as a eye in the sky. Uh, type of deal and and but what industry wants to see though for it being used is like post plant and survival surveys post thinning disease monitoring and all those things and um, furthermore 96 percent of them said that they wanted to learn how to apply deep learning to the data that they are capturing uh, we also asked them about recruitment um, and 94% of them felt that hiring a new forester with UAV skills would be desirable. Uh, majority of them thought that experience with UAV, UAVs alone was enough, though 27% felt that certification was crucial. So that's, a, that's an interesting data there that, we, that we've gathered. Um, and finally, we asked them about um, training. So, and, and, and we saw that 76% of the, uh, uh, saw the value of new foresters coming out of uni already with UAV skills and certification. We also saw nearly half of the group prefers to have their staff be in actual UAV training courses, but more than half uh, were fine with self-led training. So there's definitely a room for both, uh, for both options. However, only 46% felt, felt that there is adequate UAV training available out there to foresters wanting to train and upscale. Uh, moving on to our applications, Tools of Foresters has developed or developing SOPs for when you begin operations in forestry down to processing the data captured by your UAVs. So we have three areas for that, which is the essentials, the operations, and the processes. Um, for the essentials, we have uh, planning your operation, how to carry them out, pre-flight checks, a hazard registry, and establishing ground control points, 
And we'll also uh, teach you on how to match uh, structure from motion models to an existing LIDAR terrain model. Um, for the operations, you are currently working on the post finning assessment there. So there's definitely a lot of good stuff coming, uh, uh, coming in the pipeline. And lastly, for the processes, uh, we are working on the SOP in teaching users how to apply deep learning uh, UAV imagery to check stand density. So that is uh, coming soon. Um, so we have compiled a number of SOPs, which are very much available in our website. Um, uh, the first added SOPs in the TFF workshop uh, portion there is how to plan UAV operations and uh, pre-flight checks. Uh, and these two are being endorsed by UAV and Z, and these will enable UAV users in the forestry to conduct rigorous and safe UAV operations in forestry environments. Um, and the rest here is being finalized. So this is our people. Our committee members are from all sections of industry, bringing along with them a, a very rich and diverse set of skills uh, to the table, uh, making sure that initiative this initiative is as relevant, as inclusive, and uh, as industry-based as possible. So moving on to our website, um, it is very much live now, and you can feel free, feel free to visit it at your own leisure. Uh, we've got different sections there, like the tools section, which you can see uh, housing all of our SOPs. And it also has a list of all this GIS softwares and flight planning um, programs that might come in handy as you plan your operation. We've also got a section for our updates, our news. Uh, it also has our newsletter there for you to read. Um, this section uh, shows all of our uh, committee members. Uh, they, it, you can also find their, their contact details if you wish to contact them. And lastly, uh, this is our um, public forum platform, which we will get to in the coming uh, slides. But before that, uh, Tools for Foresters does have a mailing list, um, uh, it, which you can subscribe to. So we now have a growing list of members receiving the mailing list, both locally and internationally. Uh, members include forest growers, contractors, government representatives, researchers, and academics. Uh, we will also be look, looking to recruit a beta testing team, as I've said earlier, uh, as we churn out these SOPs and that, these applications. So uh, do feel free to sign up. We encourage your staff to sign up for our, um, at our mailing list at our website. Um, or you can also scan this QR code here on your screen. This would uh, immediately take you, automatically take you to our subscription page um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the mailing list. And as you subscribe, you will be sent an access link to our uh, Discord platform, which is our public forum platform. Um, so this is our, uh, Discord is the public forum platform that Tools for Foresters has chosen. Um, uh, it is not publicly available though. Uh, you can only get it as you subscribe to the list and you will get that specific invite for the server. So the reason why we also chose Discord is that uh, we are all about sharing and more about wanting to to uh, have a have a place where everybody uh, in in this space can come together with their issues, their problems, and their 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 questions. Uh, we and we also encourage people to use this platform to ask advice on, for example, what is the best UAVs to to use for certain operations, and also what is the best setting uh, to to have it at as you go along with your operations. Um, so we've got different uh, sections, different categories or channels, as you might say, in Discord. Uh, for example, in this one channel, uh, one member came in with a problem that he's been having um, with, uh, with, post, with, uh, with a post-processing issue that he's been having. And a couple of, a couple of guys jumped in with, uh, with, with, with solutions that they already had when they uh, came 
came uh, in, uh, came through this pr uh, problem before. So imagine the uh, the amount of time that he was able to save uh, just by you know uh, putting it up in the in the forum and then having solutions brought up to him in a, in a couple of hours or or, or days. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's one of the things that we have going on in the Discord tools for Forester server. Uh, we've also got other uh, fun stuff going on, um, other sections just like this open source spatial data section. We've also got mapping. We've also got flight planning. Um, we've also got sections here where you can share your UAV images and videos of your operation. And, and, and sharing all those cool stuff with uh, with with all the with all the people in the server. Um, so it's it's definitely early days for the initiative, um, but now we're starting to get some traction. And the recent collaboration with UAVNZ to endorse our SOPs uh, will only help us to standardize UAV use in the in the industry. Um, so as I close, I, I would just like to. Uh, say thanks to the UAV and Z for their support and the endorsement. Um, there's probably a lot of people that I, I have to thank, but it'll probably take me a couple of days to finish them all. But I'd just like to say thanks for all the, uh, the TFF committee members for their dedication and their time, uh, Rena Joy and Claire for their web design and the funding for this and committee work, uh, Mike, Aaron, and for the, uh, in the RSA, RSCG uh, and for their continued support and just everybody in the industry who has uh, supported us so far. Uh, and that is all for, for me. Thank you so much for your time and attention and hope you guys have a good day. Awesome, thanks Dave. Um, really, really good presentation there. Um, I personally just signed up for the Tools for Forestry's email list. Cheers. <laughs> yes. I also put the link in the chat box there. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask them there and we'll uh, deal them with, with everyone's uh, been had their time to speak. Next up, we've got Scott Spooner from SPS Automation. I'll pass you over to Scott. All yours, Scott. G'day. Um, I'll just bring up my, my slideshow. Uh, just be with me a second. Right, uh, hopefully that is displaying correctly now. Okay, so I'm Scott and I'm the CEO and CTO of SPS Automation. Um, oh, there we go. SPS Automation uh, specializes in sensor-based AI and all sorts of different types of bespoke robotics for a variety of industries. And I'm here sort of talking today around a couple of our projects that we're doing uh, along uh, in the forestry scene, along with um, some of our other sort of forest or pine based work. So what, what do foresters want? We sort of talk to the industry and ask them around what tools can be helpful for in UAV based systems for being out in the field and what they want to do. And there was three main categories we sort of uh, came across, which is one is the mapping and terrain modeling of new, um, new forests and current, uh, current forest systems, release spraying of um, you know, new forestry establishment, and then weed and invasive uh, plant control across uh, you know, new forests and ongoing forest systems. And that includes the wilding pine uh, situation that can be spreading away from uh, planned forestry blocks. And the concerns are primarily around the skills required to use uh, some of the larger, more complex UAV systems and the safety involved with that. Regulation is a, plays a big part, especially in forestry, and also to do with cost and whether that cost benefit will be you know, an improvement on current systems in place. So we've been working on a system which is not just for forestry, but for a variety of different sectors. And that's sort of around what I call removing the pilot from the operation on the ground. And it's a system as a service where 
hardware uh, from mapping aircraft to spraying aircraft can be provided to a client and then remotely operated and monitored in real time uh, using uh, our localized um, control command center here in Christchurch. So we're trying to remove some of the complexity of operations in certain different uh, in different types of um, agricultural systems. And I'm going to be talking today primarily around our spray system um, for wild and conifer control. And also we've been doing some work with um, you know, spraying new forests. So all of our equipment is made here in New Zealand um, between our two companies based in Timaru Aeronavics and SPS Automation based in Christchurch. So we're very proud to be New Zealand made um, and it, it do everything in house. So I'm gonna st start with talking a bit about release spraying using UAVs. Um, we're fairly new to this type of operation, but um, so I'll just cover some of the work we've done towards release spraying and some of the uh, around new forestry establishment. But the bulk of my sort of talk will be around the control of wildings and other invasive species uh, using the spray system that we've been developing. So release spraying is basically putting out herbicide uh, to um, kill the grass and other weeds that might choke or, you know, uh, cause new forestry establishment to struggle. And some of the, the leading issues that um, the forestry company that we have been working with has had is limited staff resources, uh, uh, sorry, limited staff resourcing. Um, they currently have people walking around manually spraying um, the trees and as well as, well as how do we put all the trees everywhere that are required to go? So we're looking at developing a system that can branch out some of these things and uh, take over the release spraying of um, you know, new forests or regeneration of uh, weeds that might be in young, young uh, tree trees. So we sort of started with how can we go to a site and optimize how to plant all the trees on a new forestry establishment? If we're going to use UAVs to spot spray and plant these trees, we need to know where they're going to be and how they're going to be um, how they're going to be planted in the spacing. So we sort of started working with some algorithms to Place, tre uh, place trees based on several different types of stacking algorithms. And then we've been looking at how can we use the contours of the land to develop flight plans so that our UAVs can plant these trees uh, in the most efficient way possible because flying up and down hills is not always that great. We also got out to do some um, spraying in uh, collaboration with Sion and Pampak Forest and Forest Growers Research Limited. Um, this was a trial that we did uh, a few months ago, um, testing what UAVs are like in close proximity on farmland and actually basically getting boots on ground and learning as much as we can about what the challenges are around operating in newly established forests. This, the data from this trial is still being collected, but um, I just thought I'd share some of the pictures from when we were out there spraying. So um, it was a good time, we learned a lot. I'm going to move on to what the primary focus of the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years um, is, and that's the control of uh, wild and conifers and an automated system that we can use to go out and spray these trees, whether they're already established or, you know, marching away from a new, a new forestry block or shelter block. Um, conifers are several different types of pine species that uh, can be very invasive and spread rapidly across the, um, the New Zealand countryside. And current methods used to control them include helicopter blanket spraying and manually um, chopping them down or drilling and pouring chemical into the into the trunks. And one of the main issues around this type of um, control of these the current systems is they're not really viable for what we call sparsely infested areas. 
that can be, um, you know, it might be not financially viable to put the helicopter in. Um, they might be, too, you know, too spread apart. The terrain might be too difficult to get ground crews up into the trees um, to, to cut them down or um, to drill and fill them. So that's where our system that we're developing is concentrating. And that's, you know, remote locations, uh, buffer zone control, where maybe a helicopter is sprayed, um, sprayed a large area but we can't it can't get close to water slides or near terrain um, in certain areas and graveyard reinfestation which is where a helicopter is blanket sprayed a large um, sort of density of these trees and they've died off but there's new growth coming back and they can't send in ground crews because the existing trees the skeletons are collapsing and it's becoming dangerous So when we first started this project, um, the idea was simple. We were going to go out and survey an infested area, identify the tree locations, and then spray them using a swarm spray operation. And we wanted that system to be easy and simple to operate. We want it to be fully automatic and, um, and have a comprehensive CA back training uh, guide so that everything out there in the operation was safe to use. And we've been developing this in partnership with Aeronavics and Scion. So I'm going to run through a bit of the workflow of how the system works. And then after I sort of go through that, I'll play a bit of a video around some of the trials we've done. So where do you want to spray? We don't really want um, clients having to worry about the complexities of going out and mapping areas or trying to work out how to do flight plans. So we can just take an area, simple polygon based area, and then we can actually cloud process that, process that into automated flight paths for our mapping aircraft. The mapping aircraft is um, also fairly automated. Once we process the flights, it's automatically uploaded to the aircraft. Um, the user doesn't actually have to do anything. The idea is that it's a checklist-based stop-go operation. They take the drone out, they put it on the ground, they follow their checklist, they press go, and then we actually, in our command center, remotely operate the aircraft and monitor the health of the whole system as it's operating. Once the aircraft is finished doing its mapping run um, and we're doing several mapping runs, uh, the data is automatically uploaded to our cloud server. Um, and then we process that, process that into an ortho photo um, and generate a DM or digital terrain model and um, you know, a large uh, RGB based ortho photo for us to process. We can also um, provide the map and stuff that we've um, generated through and tiles to any type of uh, GIS software or viewable software that you require. So once we've got our big ortho photo, we feed it into a deep learning algorithm uh, and basically that will spit out an entire list of GPS coordinates of where all the pine trees that we need to go and spray are. Once we have a list of these uh, pines, we then need to work out how to visit all of those pines in the, the most optimal way. And sometimes we'll be operating more than one spray aircraft, so we need to divide that up in a way that is um, optimal for flight conditions of our, our aircraft. All of the flight plans are automatically generated and uploaded to the, um, uploaded to the aircraft through the cloud system. So that brings us to our spray aircraft. Um, there's a picture of it here. So this is a purpose-built system um, that we've designed. Um, and it's also, once again, checklist-based operation with the ability to be remotely operated and monitored. Um, we've developed a very powerful low-altitude collision avoidance system because spray machines ripping around a couple meters off the ground or a couple meters above the tops of a variety of trees and uh, complex terrain can be quite 
scary. Um, we've developed a very complex spray system that allows us to change the, um, the spray width. We, monitor, we log every single mill of every single chemical that goes out each nozzle, so they're all independently driven. So should one stop working, um, the others will deliver the correct dose. The aircraft will actually work out how big a pine is uh, once it arrives over it, uh, and then provide a targeted dose of spray. Um, and one, made, uh, one major sort of difference between our spray systems and several others that are available is our aircraft are hybrid operation, um, meaning that they actually run on petrol as opposed to traditional uh, lithium-based batteries. A big uh, reason for this is when you're out there spot spraying, you're carrying a huge amount of chemical with you with a lot of transit time. So you can't actually just take off and start dumping your spray all over the spot, all over the place. You need to be carrying it with you all over, all over uh, to all the different tree locations. So the system is fully autonomous. Um, basically, you hit go uh, out in the field and it will take off and you observe it flying around and spraying trees. So if the system is automatic and you just need to monitor what's going on, there's no reason that you can't have more than one spray aircraft operating simultaneously. And that's a big part of what we've been building in the background of our infrastructure um, is mesh network based aircraft where one aircraft can actually relay its data through another aircraft back to our command center or command, local command station. And, you just need to have one operator operating the entire fleet of spray aircraft up um, uh, on the site. We also can monitor, obviously, all of the aircraft in operation from our, uh, from our Christchurch based command center. So when it comes to spraying or not spraying, um, obviously, sometimes there's going to be things which are out there which may have been picked up as trees or maybe aren't trees. So we have what we call like a confidence factor on the aircraft. So when it arrives at a location and it identifies a particular pine, um, if the aircraft is not confident that it's a pine, it has real-time computer vision on board, which will do a secondary um, inference or real, uh, like computer vision and deep learning algorithm to say, is it a pine? If it's not confident enough, it'll prompt the um, person that's operating the system. Yes, it is. No, it's not. You know? And every time we spray any type of chemical out any of the nozzles, we're taking a picture of everything that gets sprayed, and which is really important because we take these pictures and we use them to improve the system. So as we sort of um, start spraying uh, trees and the more we use our system, the better it has been getting at being able to ident identify trees in real time. It also can dynamically add small other trees around it that may have not been picked up on the initial, um, the initial mapping run uh, on the fly and the guidance system will actually allow it to fly down and add those trees by itself. So spray spraying results. So uh, data is really important to us. It helps with uh, you know improving a lot of our systems. So we log everything. We log the amount of chemical out every single nozzle. We know the speed of the nozzle, the micron size of the droplets, which was uh, coming out. We know the time of day. We know the weather. We know the wind. We log every single sensor on the aircraft, and we allocate it to eat, you know each of that piece of data we allocate to each tree. So in you know, six months time or a year's time when the trees have uh, died, if there's a, a batch that didn't sort of brown off or die, we actually can look up and say, oh, it was actually blowing quite you know, strong from the easterly direction when we sprayed that, there might have been drift and that might have caused what was going, uh, going on to you know, affect the results. Um, it also allows for very accurate um, job, uh, how do you put it, very accurate um, 
job data. So if you're a contractor, you know exactly how much chemical you've used and it helps for predicting future jobs, um, especially after the mapping run when you know sort of what the level of trees are that you're going to need to um, spray. So part of our future pathway um, and what we're working on is we're now ready to start multi-aircraft operation. Um, we've got several spray aircraft that are just in the final um, construction phase and we're ready to go out and try a swarm operation. Um, and part of the swarm operation stuff is the dynamic, like what we call dynamic network mesh manipulation. And that's where if an aircraft flies behind a whole bunch of trees or into a valley or actually the signal integrity between the local uh, command station and the aircraft degrades, the other aircraft can move into the area to improve the um, relay of data through them, uh, through the mesh. We're also working on a docking and refueling station so that the aircraft don't actually need to have a human um, refuel them uh, or provide them with more herbicide. They just come back, get more, and then carry on going. And the idea is that these machines run continuously, uh, um, continuous operation, but it's, it's not continuous flight, but it's in the air all day long, working, spraying trees. And we're also working to include other invasive plants um, that appear across a whole variety of um, not just forestry, but uh, New Zealand agriculture, like gorse and broom and um, Nostella tussock, things like that. So up next, we did a trial with Scion um, up at the Molesworth uh, running our system. Um, this was earlier this year. There's been a bit of development since then, but I thought I'd play it because it, um, it shows a lot of this in action. So this is Jolly's Pass. Um, we were doing a, a sort of a test on the different types of on different types of chemical and the amounts of chemical that uh, we use for spraying. Um, so it will change here. So this is um, the three terrain model that we've run through our algorithm. So we were doing 275 trees. That's why they're not all selected. Um, 275 trees, different different chemicals, different um, different amounts. Our collision avoidance system uh, is still ongoing development, but we're really happy with it. Uh, primary use, uh, primary um, way it works is through LIDAR, a uh, 32 line LIDAR system. We've got real-time inference, so we've got real-time tree detection, and it can actually tell between different types of trees and kicks back to that confidence factor. The spray system, um, it will work out, yeah, the this, this size of the tree and provide the targeted dose. So that small trees get a small amount of chemical and large trees get the correct amount of chemical. The aircraft rotates, um, and if it's a really large tree, it'll actually spiral out to ensure that we get full coverage of the of the tree. So yeah, hybrid operation. It has its ups and downs, but for this application, where you're actually just flying a lot of transit, um, it really sort of comes into its own with our sort of optimum flight range, uh, flight time is around 40 minutes um, operating. And we're usually hitting around a tree a minute uh, and we're hoping to go to around two, two trees a minute, um, obviously depending on the density, but um, the a lot of that is to do with um, how accurate the collision avoidance is, and how fast we can transit across at, at low altitude. Cool, that's, that's it from me. Awesome, thanks Scott, really interesting presentation there. Um, right, uh, again, just a reminder here, we've got uh, questions in the polls there on the right hand side of the app. If you jump in there, feel free to ask questions and start some polls. And I'll pass you on to 
Dave Harry's now of um, the company name. Flying on my brain, but Dave, it's all yours. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, audio is all good. Perfect. All right. So uh, I'll just get my machine screen sharing there. Perfect. And you can see my screen coming through okay? Yep, all good. Cool. Oh, welcome to uh, the UAV and NZ uh, conference and, and particularly um, looking at innovations in forestry around drone use, uh, UAV applications. Uh, myself, Director and CTO of Interpine. Uh, Interpine's a forestry services and consulting company uh, based here in New Zealand and in operations in predominantly New Zealand and Australia. I guess uh, just a, a little bit of an intro on, on who we are. Um, we're really about shaping today's forests with technology of tomorrow. Um, while drones is, is part of our business, um, we're predominantly a remote sensing um, and technical service provider to the industry. So collection of remote sensing data is, is what we're primarily focused on. We've been around about 38 years or so, so we're a long-term business uh, in the sector and um, collecting a whole range of, of sort of that remote sensing type data, um, particularly focused on LiDAR, just because it gives us a, a different way of measuring and assessing uh, standing forest, uh, as well as, of course, traditional um, aerial photography um, type imagery, etc. So, you know, I guess um, what we've learned through the application of remote sensing from fixed wing um, helicopters and uh, satellites is, is flowed through into our applications and use in the drone industry as well. Um, so just that really just sums up a little bit of uh, where we've come to over the last 38 years and as inside the drone space uh, we've been operating uh, our drone operations since around 2015. Um, one of the key attributes is that we saw was really the ability to get drones into the hands of our foresters um, throughout the industry. And that's our forest engineers, our civicultural foresters, our harvesting foresters. And, um, and I guess we had this vision of, uh, you know, being able to ensure that each of those are operating with a drone in the back seat of their vehicle. Um, I think you've all probably stood in front of a forest at some stage in your lives and you've realised that it's quite hard to actually get a perspective uh, on the crop uh, as it's growing and that's simply because of the trees standing in front of you. So I think David uh, mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the use in, in forestry context is, is this eye in the sky. And so um, we've had around 240 foresters come through our Pacific training. We do it with Massey School of Aviation and um, great to see them getting out there and doing it the right way, um, learning about airspace. And I think we have a benefit in the industry that it's mostly driven by corporates um, and a corporates are really health and safety conscious and they've taken on the initiative to get their pilots certified um, and take advantage of these tools. I think um, in terms of uh, showcasing a little bit about how uh, drones are being used in the industry, um, I thought I'd just pick on a few sort of specific, more specialist GIS applications, I guess, and, and how they're being applied. Uh, so I think, you know, talking on from where David with the tools for foresters, um, the ability for foresters to get out there, um, collect small area mapping, and, and being able to quantify, in this case, uh, simply counting trees using machine learning uh, really gives them an advantage in getting uh, boots off the ground and, and, like David mentioned, out of the blackberry and the gorse. That, that kind of machine learning, you know, extends right through to uh, the seedlings being grown at the nursery. And so what we're seeing is, is drones being deployed into those environments. Um, so not only are we stop taking and, and getting a quantification of our forests as they're growing out, out in the uh, rural areas, but, but also doing that um, down at the seedling level as well. I think one of the, the biggest innovations we've seen of recent is 
the expansion of LiDAR uh, on drones. This has um, been an evolution over the last decade, and we're seeing you know, more and more sensors being fully integrated into those drone platforms. And um, that's a real benefit for the forest industry. Um, the one thing about LiDAR that's a little bit different is that it's an active sensor. It's sending a laser pulse down through the canopy, which allows us to, to not only measure the, the trees themselves, but also um, detect the ground uh, underneath those trees, which gives us the ability to, to assess attributes like canopy dynamics, uh, tree height, uh, et cetera. This really aids over and above the, the sort of standard machine learning that you're seeing um, applied to just sort of photogrammetry data sets um, aerial photography type uh, information. So, you know, I think um, a huge percentage of uh, forestry across New Zealand is, is in that sort of small to medium woodlot um, outside of the major corporates. And, you know, here's a typical example of, of a mum and dad sort of New Zealand woodlot on a farm um, around 10 hectares, um, very quickly flown with drone based LIDAR. Uh, as opposed to the mobilisation cost of, of a large fixed wing uh, mobile scanner. So if we um, extract that data and, and analyse it, you can see that um, we can actually go through and detect each of those individual trees, um, allows us to do that stop take, that what we call a, a resource inventory of that forest, uh, and subsequently evaluation for uh, either harvest or, or for sale. Pretty neat, we're seeing uh, some of these drones sort of reach below the canopy as well. So um, while experimental and we're working together with Scion on this, um, we can see that in this case here, we've got a Emerson hover map um, LiDAR unit um, flying within the tree canopy. I guess uh, while this you know, still has its challenges um, in terms of operationalizing this, um, what we have been doing is using these kind of units underneath the canopy uh, an experimental use for the assessment of, of the actual trees themselves. So while we, we can fly the drone above and we get a good picture, um, if we fly it below the canopy, we can start actually extracting out um, core details such as the diameter of the trees and therefore the volume of the wood that can be extracted. Um, look, flying them within the canopy has its challenges. Uh, so we've also been mounting some of these sensors uh, on backpacks as well and, and simply walking them around. But I guess the, the overall goal there is, is potentially seeing them flying under the canopy more and more as that technology evolves. And, and certainly what it gives us is incredibly rich data. So this is an example of a, a small survey plot um, being scanned uh, from within the canopy. And we're really looking forward to you know, continuing to evolve um, the use of drones, not, not only from above, uh, but from within as well. This kind of data is exactly what we need for the purposes of forest valuation and the resource assessment. And so it's, it's critical to that next phase of actually delivering those uh, forest and wood products uh, to the customers. So we can see that um, you know, across a whole range of varying forest types, uh, this kind of information's just invaluable, really. And um, and again, just taking taking the pe people off the ground, uh, out of the blackberry, out of the gorse, out of the steep slopes, uh, making it a safer operation. And of course, uh, we have to process that data, and um, and it's really about sort of introducing you know these smarts of AI, machine learning, and so on. Uh, putting them into environments where, in this case, virtual reality, where people can assess that data coming off those drones and, um, and sort of, again, move them out of the forest, but still get the, the same answer uh, that we need in terms of the data. So here's, here's an example data set of one of our foresters wandering around the forest, um, assessing uh, the diameter of the trees, the volume of the extractable wood products, et cetera, um, from that kind of data. And of course, yeah, it's, it's changing the way that uh, some of our foresters work. Um, this particular Nani Teoki has been with us for, for over 30 years in the industry, um, predominantly always been uh, running through the gorse, um, but now sits, sits in that virtual reality environment, uh, scanning the trees. 
Uh, one of the other areas that drones are being used is, is around pest control. So um, many of you have probably um, had a look at some of the work that we've done with uh, fire and emergency um, in the wildfire space, um, but also using the thermal cameras and um, night vision cameras in the same context for, for forestry pest control. So in this case here, what we're actually targeting are these little critters, uh, these little wallaby, and certainly in the North Island, uh, they're actually quite small. They're not much bigger than a, than a large possum, really. And so thermal alone is quite tricky in terms of species identification. <clears throat> so what you can see on the right-hand side is your typical sort of thermal view from a, from a drone. Um, but looking on the right-hand side, you can see that you've got that optical zoom uh, night vision working with an IR illuminator. And that's, that's out around that six, 700 metres there, uh, seeing those cattle in the paddock. So putting these two together um, allows that pest control operation to be much more effective and particularly around species ID. You can see a small deer just sitting under a tree there um, and again very easy to, uh, to observe those without getting um, the drones too close to those animals and, um, and being able to zoom in with that night vision combined with the uh, IR illuminator. You see some pretty cool things out there to be fair. And so, yeah, pretty neat seeing those little critters uh, getting around the forest. And of course, in this case, um, uh, our target species is uh, these wallabies. Looking at another use case, um, soon after harvesting, the, there's a need to actually come back and do a bit of a KPI on the harvesting operations, make sure we're extracting all the merchantable volume and, and getting it to market as much as what we can. And so drones are really providing that eye in the sky capability. And so traditionally, this, is, this has always been done manually. Um, and it's another example of where we're, we're taking the, the human out of the loop um, in that slip, trip and fall environment. So, you know, this is a little bit of a view of, of doing it manually. Um, you're certainly working through, you know, pretty steep terrain at times, um, and certainly that slip, trip, and fall uh, is is certainly a, a hazard that we're wanting to get rid of um, across the industry. So, if we looked at how that's being done now, uh, the deployment of drones um, for the purposes of actually surveying uh, these type of plots where the drone is, is automated in its flight, um, following uh, the terrain closely and collecting these kind of survey plots uh, automatically and stopping that operator having to walk in and across those cutovers. And of course, that means that they're, they're back in front of the computer, um, assessing and, and measuring those uh, plots, um, educating machine learning to get better and better at doing that, um, all with the the leisure of uh, being out of the rain, hail and shine, and, uh, and having a coffee while they're doing it. Of course, there's other benefits uh, that we're finding across the industry, uh, management of uh, residue and debris as well. So introducing some of those machine learning algorithms to, to pick up uh, that particularly in our riparian areas. So what you can see there is those highlighted little green bars uh, all across there, uh, the residue that we're interested in managing. And of course, uh, we've got a waterway there in the riparian area. And as an industry, uh, from an environmental perspective, we can better uh, manage that hazard with this kind of information. So you're seeing more and more uh, of the foresters collecting this kind of detailed with a mosaic type uh, imagery and then passing them through uh, these tools for foresters uh, type toolkits uh, that David talked about, being able to identify this kind of information. Uh, one other little unique use is uh, looking at how we can use full motion video mapping in these environments. And so in this case here, um, like you're, many of you are familiar with, you, you get detailed point clouds uh, from the uh, drones flying. And, and of course we can measure each of those trees and give them heights, et cetera. But one little unique use is <clears throat> during the assessment uh, or the harvesting operation is to minimize the breakage on the trees when they actually are felling them. 
And so what we've got here is we can see a, a, a harvesting machine just about to cut down uh, this particular tree, which has got a 3D model on the left-hand side here. And <clears throat> we can simply sit here and we can watch uh, using the Esri uh, full motion video tool set and, uh, and we can sit here and uh, monitor that harvesting uh, operation. Uh, we can freeze frame it, we can drop into the imagery. And in this case here, we can measure uh, any breakage or, or the uh, measurable stem length that that operator is being able to achieve with that particular machine, 34 meters in that particular case. So of course, um, giving those operators feedback finding the good operators, helping them teach and learn from, from others. Awesome. Another... Sorry, <coughs> we're just running yeah. up right up to the point here. If we uh, keep going, we'll roll over. Not that this isn't amazing. I'm sitting here going, this, the resolution and the imagery here is incredible. Um, yeah, amazing. and that's, that's us, Chris. So um, happy to good. hand you back. And... Good timing, cool. <laughs> I'm watching the clock and going to some QA. <laughs> um, while we've got a minute or so, um, we'll quickly look at the polls and uh, quick Q&A. I think the only question asked was, asked was by me, but um, Scott will have a look at it. Um, so the polls were, what is the current state of UAV forestry in New Zealand? Um, got slow moving, growing, uh, under, underutilized as being the uh, key words in that. And the future state being revolutionary. Has anyone got any topics on that? Any comments on that? Other than I'm pretty sure you all agree with those comments. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely, Chris. I, I think um, there probably isn't any uh, forest manager across the country that now does not at least have a drone um, of some shape or form. Um, typically, the sort of you know the DJI, as David mentioned, uh, and they're using it for their eye in the sky type surveys. Um, the neat thing there is they're learning all the, the right places to fly, the certification needed and, and you know, that awareness. Um, and it really just opens the door massively to, you know, how can we improve the way that we interpret that data, um, automate it and get more out of it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's amazing being seeing it picked up. It's such an awesome use case for, for flying drones up forestry. It should be using the drones term, Isaac's reminding me. <laughs> yes, 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 that's right. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks, guys. We'll leave it there and I'll um, let everyone get a minute or so to jump to the next session. Thank you all. Thank you all.